Morning, everybody. I think we'll get started. It's just a couple minutes after 10 o'clock. Uh, there may be some of some folks joining us in a couple minutes, but we can definitely get started. Um, good morning to those on the West Coast. Uh, good afternoon, early afternoon to those on the East Coast. And for those of, the, those of you in the middle of the country, thank you for joining us during your lunch break. Uh, my name is Mike Pietrakowski and welcome to part two of our going back to work, health, safety, and legal concerns. Um, I'm a partner with the law firm of Gordon Reese, Scully and Manza County. One of my duties at Gordon and Reese is I'm chair of our environmental and toxic tort practice group, which means I spend a lot of time dealing with issues like indoor air quality issues, like HVAC issues. That ranges from everything from what I call the A disease uh, asbestos, mold, uh, lead, radon, fire hazards, Legionella, it's quite an extensive list of issues. Um, and unsurprisingly over the last, well, I'd say about three or four months, this thing called the coronavirus has also been, become a part of my practice. I, 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 like all of us, could not have predicted that that was gonna be an issue five, six months ago. So we really welcome you. And as I mentioned, this is part two of our presentation. I, I'd like to briefly introduce our, my co-presenters. Uh, first is David Brickenhoff. Uh, David is an industrial hygienist uh, with Forensic Analytical. Um, in part one, we had David's colleague, John Martinelli. John's an environmental and health safety professional. David brings a, a slightly different view to this. He's a certified industrial hygienist. He focuses on work site exposures and issues. Uh, like I just talked about, he does a lot in terms of looking at and analyzing indoor air quality issues. And uh, is, like I mentioned, is over the last of three to four months is extremely busy helping forensic clients deal with the COVID related issues. Forensic just very quickly is a, um, an analytical consulting services and environmental and health safety issues. They have offices throughout the West Coast. I think they're in a total of six or seven states and they have partnership with other like professionals and they can cover the entire United States. So David, thank you for joining us. Next. Uh, as a co-presenter is Marie Trimble Holbeck. Marie's one of my partners at Gordon and Reese. Marie specializes in employment issues and retail and hospitality uh, clients. More specifically, Marie uh, has what I would call a subspecialty is she represents both in counseling and litigation restaurants. Uh, Marie, like David and myself, and like probably many of you, has been very busy over the last several months dealing with and counseling for restaurant clients and some of her other employer clients on employment issues. Um, you know, I, I didn't clear this with Marie first, but I, I'm just gonna take the liberty of saying this. You, you know, restaurants um, aren't at full speed as we all know. In certain parts of the country, they're starting to open up. But the reality is it's going to take six, seven, maybe nine months until we get past COVID. And we will get past it. It's just a question of when. And when that happens, I have no doubt that restaurants are going to be overwhelmed with business. And the better the restaurant, the busier it's going to be. So I, I'm going to take a liberty, Marie, if it's okay with you, and tell everybody when all these restaurants, when all your clients open up and you've got a great set of clients that are fantastic restaurants, great food, fun places to go to, that they can send you an email because you can get us all reservations at these restaurants when it opens up. I, I hope that's okay, Marie, if I, if I offered you for that purpose. Oh, yeah. Uh, 
Real quickly, a couple of housekeeping matters, and, and I think everybody's already done the first one, which is please uh, go on mute, whether you're on phone or your computer. It really does help the quality of the, the sound and listening for everybody. And um, the other issue is um, questions. We invite and welcome your questions, and we find the most efficient way to collect those questions for us to be able to respond to them is if you could use the chat format within the, the WebEx system. We're using WebEx here. Uh, there's a chat system. You can type in the questions. We'll collect them, and it depends on how much I get right now. But if, if, if I keep within my time limits, we'll have some time at the end of this. We'll, we'll answer as many questions as we can. If we cannot get to your question within our hour, and we're going to be very strict, we're going to we respect your time, we're going to end uh, promptly at 11 West Coast time. Uh, we'll email you uh, our thoughts, our answers to that. I want to also just very briefly mention my law firm, Gordon Reese Scully and Manzacani. We're the only law firm in the country that has offices in all 50 states. We are what they call a full service law firm. What does that mean? I, I, I think the easiest answer to that is, is if you have a legal question, whether it be for counseling or litigation or business related, we have the lawyers within our group, which is now something like 900 strong. We can handle that. And then we are a defense firm. In other words, we represent companies, corporations, and individuals who have claims filed against them or lawsuits filed against them. So, of course, we're happy to help anybody, but particular as a concern to topics we're talking about today. Uh, we're going to talk about going back to work, the legal issues, the health and safety issues, and we're also going to talk a little bit about the, um, the regulatory issues. But if you joined us for part one, you'll remember that I was pretty frustrated with the taint, the word coronavirus tainted one, the name of one of my favorite beverages, Corona Beer, and that really frustrates me. I think it's unfair to Corona Beer, but I suggested to everybody that here's what we'll do. We'll, we'll use Corona Beer, beaches, pools, and all those sun, fun summertime events. We'll use those as a reward because we're all business-wise and personally, we have to make sacrifices to get through this international health an economic crisis, but we'll make those sacrifices and our reward will be the Corona beer, the beaches, the pools. But I, I'm afraid some people took, misunderstood my message. I, my, my message is it's after we're through this crisis, not now. I wasn't inviting people to go out and drink beer and to get together with hundreds and thousands of other people. And, and I say that because it's a reminder to all of us that going back to work, going through this crisis means we really have to take it step by step. There's no jumping into the pool and being immersed in the deep end. It really has to be step by step. And in some cases, they're small baby type of steps. So David's going to talk about the health and safety issues and briefly the regulatory issues. And we're going to be a little more focused on California, but generally the issues will apply throughout the country. And then Marie's going to talk about a, a lot of the employment issues that she's dealing with. And I'm going to start by giving an overview of what's going on throughout the country in terms of lawsuits. Uh, as I mentioned in our, in our part one, our first presentation, there are already a lot of lawsuits. There are concern refunds of, for travel cancellation, refunds of payments. One classic example is people suing to get tuitions back from universities like University of Southern California, Boston University, Indiana University. Another area for which there have been many, in fact, maybe more than any other type of COVID-related litigation, is insurance coverage, the business interruption. Very simply and quickly, that's a claim where somebody goes to their insurance company and says, my policy covers my loss of business, my loss of revenue, because my business had to be stopped, had to be interrupted. The simple example I gave last time that I think is a good example because of what something David's going to talk about, what Marie's going to talk about, 
is the restaurant. If a car, somebody loses control of their car and hits the front of your restaurant and does damage to the restaurant and you have to close your restaurant for several weeks, you're entitled to go to your insurance carrier and say, do I have coverage for that? And if I have business interruption coverage, most likely, and it depends on the exact terminology of the policy, most likely you have coverage. So there are disputes, uh, and, and I'll just touch upon those very quickly here. There are disputes as to whether or not there was physical damage caused by the coronavirus or whether people's businesses were interrupted, stopped because of government regulations that forced people to shut down, created the in shelter at home provisions. So that's a, a very significant part of the litigation that we've already seen. We've also seen litigation over loans and debts, product pricing, marketing labels, many, many, and including employment, which Marie's gonna talk about. The question I, I'm gonna pose for everybody now is, or you may ask me, is how many more lawsuits are we gonna see? Well, according to a certain senior senator, U.S. Senator, he thinks it's gonna be a litigation pandemic. He's even gone so far as to say, it's gonna be the second pandemic we're gonna see. I don't personally like to use the term pandemic. I mean, we are in a health crisis and people are dying, but I do agree with the concept that we're gonna see a flood of lawsuits. We're not gonna just see more lawsuits we're going to see a significant amount of new lawsuits being filed. Let me give you just a couple quick examples. In California, over the last several months, we've had more than a thousand lawsuits filed just against government entities because of uh, challenges to the government orders. Here's an interesting lawsuit. Uh, I talked the first time about we may see lawsuits from people that already have pre-existing respiratory conditions and they're gonna claim that they had aggravation because of getting COVID, whether they get a, a serious dose of COVID uh, or whether it's more minor, we're still gonna see those kind of lawsuits. Well, here, here's a twist on that concept. A plaintiff recently, an individual recently in Philadelphia, I, I'm sorry, in Pennsylvania, filed a lawsuit against a store because the store forced her to leave because she would not wear her mask. And her claim is she couldn't wear the mask because she had a pre-existing respiratory condition and it affected her ability to breathe. That's the basis of her lawsuit. Now, you know, query why somebody with a respiratory condition in this COVID situation and this crisis is out shopping, um, but that's, a, that's perhaps a story for another day. Other types of lawsuits that we've seen recently, shareholder security lawsuits, cruise lines have been sued because the claim is the, the executives, the board of directors haven't properly managed the company. 50% drop in stock value in the Norwegian cruise line. That's just amazing. That's the kind of stock I think I usually end up buying. Um, I mentioned the business interruption. There have been so many cases under the coverage issue business interruption that our federal courts are thinking of consolidating them. There are too many and it's burdening the entire court system, the federal court system, so there's discussion about taking those cases and putting them all with one, maybe two judges throughout the country. And that, that does happen, but that only happens, and it happened historically only in situations where there've been so many cases, and that's what the court sees. Why do I think there can be this flood of lawsuits? Well, a couple basic facts. One is a practical issue. You know, courthouses are, are businesses unto themselves. I mean, they have court employees, and guess what? When there was a shutdown, when there were the in-shelter orders, the courts were affected by that. So many of the courts shut down completely. And in fact, in places like San Francisco, you could not even file a, a lawsuit. You could not even initiate your lawsuit. Well, that's changing. Courthouses are starting to open up again. So. No surprise, people are filing lawsuits and COVID-related lawsuits. Uh, we have some data. Uh, if we compare the filing of lawsuits for the first half of this year with 2018 and 2019, we see an increase of filings compared to the two prior years in employment cases and insurance cases. So the data there is to support 
the claim or the concern about how many lawsuits we're going to get. Why else do I think we'll see more lawsuits? Well, this isn't going to surprise anybody. It's part of our society. It's part of our culture. Uh, it's big business to file lawsuits. We, I'm a defense lawyer, um, but as a defense lawyer, as well as many of you as professionals should recognize the plaintiff's bar is very talented. They're creative. They look for opportunities and COVID presents opportunities and they're well-funded. They have the ability to file lawsuits and to fund them. What's another reason why I think we're gonna see a lot of lawsuits? Well, jury consultants, psychologists, psychiatrists who examine the thought process of the population and then what those thoughts and beliefs are when they come into the courtroom, they're telling us that they think the post-pandemic juror is going to give even larger verdicts than what we've seen in the last few years. Now, as a trial lawyer, that's scary. And it's also part, in part shocking because we've seen huge verdicts, sometimes for relatively modest injuries. We've seen hundreds of millions of dollars given in cases, and, and sometimes for very serious injury, but hundreds of millions of dollars, huge amounts of money awarded to single individuals. And so here's just a list of some of the factors that the jury consultants are telling us they're concerned about. High unemployment, the psychological imprint or what they're calling the collective trauma from COVID. They're looking at the millenniums and the generation, um, it says general, it should say, should say generation Y, uh, a group that for their life, they haven't gone through an event like this. Many were very, very young or not even born when 9-11 occurred. The recent protests, which highlights the individual, the small guy against the large company, fear and unknown, all support the jury consultant's belief that we're going to see very high verdicts if cases and when cases go to trial. I would also submit there's a public policy movement within the country and within the government to some extent that's promoting lawsuits. The theme is protect the worker, protect the workplace. We all agree with that. There's nothing wrong with that. But there's a power of suggestion in play here, and maybe sometimes more than just simple suggestion, which might be inviting even more lawsuits. Here's an illustration of that. In California, a governor issued an executive order that said there's a rebuttable presumption that the site of infection is the work, workplace. Let me repeat that. The site of infection is the workplace. Well, that's good in a sense. If you're a business owner, that means people, your employees who get sick, and that's what it was directed at, if they get sick, they're going to bring their claim not as a civil claim, they're not going to fight it as an employment claim, they're going to bring it as a workers' compensation claim, which is a statutory administrative system, which is very efficient and cost effective. That's the good news. But think of the bad news. Think of the message that is sending to everybody. If you have COVID, the presumption is it occurred at the workplace. It didn't occur at home. It didn't occur on the subway and the BART train in the Bay Area or a number of, number of other places where it could have occurred. We're just going to presume that it occurred at the workplace. I mentioned the, the lawsuits, the coverage issues, the business interruption issue. I, I'm going to suggest there's also a public policy promoting even more lawsuits and promoting those lawsuits in general. In California, our insurance commissioner issued a statement as early as April saying policyholders deserve all services, coverage, and benefits they are due under their policy. And, and, and nobody disagrees with that, but that's unusual. And in fact, the insurance commissioner doesn't come out and say that when there's automobile accidents. So it's an invitation for insurance companies to think twice, three times, maybe longer and more about whether or not they're going to deny coverage. In Illinois, they're taking it a step further. There's even a, a bill under consideration that would pro provide retroactive coverage for business interruption. And you might even remember this very early on, President Trump, Republican, pro-business, even he came out and he thought that insurance companies should step up and pay businesses for business interruption. Are there going to be more than lawsuits? Yeah, I think so. 
and, and this is now, I'm stepping a little bit into David's territory here. Um, there were 4,500, 4,500 claims filed under OSHA. There haven't been that many citations yet, but, but I think we're going to see more citation. I mean, OSHA was overwhelmed for the few several months, but yet they, there were claims made to OSHA, and now OSHA's turn to go out and investigate those claims. Is there help on the horizon for the business owner? Is there help to prevent or in some way limit the kind of lawsuits that people would bring that would be COVID related? Well, let's talk about that for a couple minutes. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce is trying to do that. They are lobbying very hard in Washington, D.C. for protection for healthcare providers, pharmaceutical companies, and food related businesses. And that's great if you're a business, one of those business owners, but what about all the other business owners? That's a pretty short list, I would suggest. Um, is there going to be protection for the business owner against the COVID related lawsuit at the federal level? Well, it breaks down pretty simply, and this is unsurprising. The Democrats are pro employee, let's pr protect the employees, and the Republicans are let's protect the businesses and the economy. And that, you know, this is me pontificating right now, but the chances of those two sides getting together anytime time soon to figure out some form of federal protection for businesses, I think is pretty slim. How about at the state level? Again, will there be protection for businesses against COVID related lawsuits? Well, there has been some activity in the Northeast. Various states have provided limited protection for healthcare professionals, facility, healthcare facilities and volunteer organizations. I just want to point out that the facilities includes the nursing homes and like facilities. And I, and I, I find that really interesting and I think we're going to, have to see a lot more from a legal standpoint analysis of that issue. A recent statistic and data just came out that out of our 116,000 deaths in this country, and that number we all know is growing, approximately 40% were related to nursing home and like facilities, either residents or providers, uh, medical care providers at those facilities. So we'll, we'll have to see how that develops as we go forward. In North Carolina, they were a little bit more aggressive, but they label it temporary liability protection for essential businesses and emergency response entities. Now, essential covered a pretty wide range of businesses, groceries, hardware stores, banks, takeout restaurants. So I, I would submit to you that that's one of the more aggressive statutes, state laws in place that protects uh, businesses. And then I wanted to throw in Utah because they represent, I think, the far spectrum in terms of protection against lawsuits. Uh, they provided immunity to business owners for injuries or damages that are COVID related if the infection allegedly occurred at their premise. And what's interesting about this one is uh, within days after that law was passed, there are stories and reports of employers telling employees, you got to come to work regardless of how you feel, regardless of what pre-existing condition you have. And the response is, and the argument is, well, yeah, of course an employer would say that. They're protected. They can't get sued. It's not that simple, but you can see the back and forth issues that are going on at the state level. Um, I'm going to pass on to David now, who's going to talk, as I said, about some of the risk management issues as it pertains to health and safety issues. Before I do, I just want to wrap up quickly uh, and just tell you from a legal standpoint, I think you have to accept the reality. There are lawsuits, there are going to be more. I'm going to suggest it's going to be an enormous amount of lawsuits. Be proactive. Practice not only good risk management by having good policies and protocols, but write them down and make sure your people are following those protocols and memorialize that as well. Communications key, Maria will touch briefly upon that. And then the final point I want to invite people to consider, and, and it does sound a little, little self-promoting here, but I, I think it's important to consider the concept of risk transfer. Consider bringing in professionals to help you make those decisions about protocol and practices. 
talk to your insurance broker. What kind of coverage do you have? What kind of activities can you do that will help you get coverage for your business as you go forward? Talk to the lawyers, talk to the environmental health safety, and talk to David, talk to the industrial hygienist, talk to people that are specialists and understand the regulations and understand the health and safety consequences. So again, thank you for joining us. I'll come back towards the end, but I want to pass this to David. David? Hey, thank you, Mike. Appreciate it. Um, so about a month ago when we had this, the first part of this, uh, this webinar, we spent a lot of time talking about return to work programs. What kind of program do you need to put into place to protect uh, your employees, visitors to your buildings? And we spent a lot of focus on that. Uh, about a month out now, I want to talk about what's changed. Has anything significant changed? What stayed the same? And I want to share some real world experiences about um, the implementation of these return to work programs. And then I'll talk a little bit about uh, next steps and where we go. We probably won't have time for ventilation, but if we do, uh, there's a couple of things we can talk about there. Um, I've probably made a giant mistake in not having a a well-formed, well-thought-out disclaimer on the bottom of this. But honestly, I've given this disclaimer so many times at this point that I just couldn't bring myself to do it. But I'll say it here. This is a complex and evolving issue. What we think we know today may be different by the end of this webinar. Uh, so you know, consult your, your, your reputable resources, WHO, CDC, local county uh, health authorities, um, because this is all changing very quickly. Next slide, Mike. So in the last month, we've had a few things that have changed. Um, there's been some new guidance documents that have come out from the CDC. Uh, CDC has this document called uh, Daily Life and Coping, and it, it really talks about, you know, as an individual, what do I need to be thinking about as I go to the grocery store and I, I go out in the world? Um, really not much new information there. Um, CDC did provide some clarification on their definition of close contact. And this is a really important definition when we talk about uh, contact tracing and, and, and risk of exposure. Um, what CDC currently says is a close close contact means you're within about six feet of somebody for more than about 15 minutes. And there's they put in a lot of caveats there. It depends if somebody coughs or sneezes. Uh, this certainly wouldn't apply to to healthcare environments, but it starts to uh, help us understand what this concept of close contact really means. It's not walking by somebody. Uh, on the street or in a hallway. It really is being close to somebody for a prolonged period of time. Uh, the state of California and the American Industrial Hygiene Association continue to put out um, industry specific guidance. I think California now has about 28 uh, guidance documents for specific industries from agriculture all the way to zoos. Not actually zoos, but things like shopping centers and offices and, and those types of things. Um, AIHA has some similar documents uh, for, for other types of industries. And then the schools have finally, the California Department of Education has finally come out uh, with some guidance for schools. And um, ultimately, I think what happens at schools is really going to be a district by district de decision. Um, there's a lot of different ways schools are considering um, bringing students back into the buildings, but we do have some guidance now. Um, with all of these guidance documents, there's really not a whole lot new. Um, the, the approach is, is, is pretty much the same. There's, there's certain things we need to, to focus on to modify the public's behavior, certain things we need to do um, with our buildings as we return people to work. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, here in the San Francisco Bay Area, there are a couple of interesting things that came out in public health orders. Uh, the, the County of San Francisco amended their masking policy to uh, require masks outdoors if anybody is going to be within 30 feet of you. Um, and uh, that's, that's a little bit different. At the same time, you can have dinner and not wear a mask if somebody's not within six feet of you indoors. So it's, it, there's some confusion there and, and potentially some conflicting information. Um, Alameda County has come out with this concept of social bubbles, where um, I can I can choose 11 other people to be in my social bubble or my pandemic pod or my COVID crew, and I can I can have more interaction with those people. Uh, the, the caveat is I've got to maintain that interaction for three weeks before I choose a new social bubble. So choose wisely, I guess, is the message. 
And then one of the more interesting things I've seen is um, sort of stamps of approval or certifications re related to COVID. Um, an industry, uh, a travel industry group uh, put their stamp of approval on Cannery Road down in Monterey saying that they've met um, all their COVID safety requirements to get their, their stamp of approval. And there's some other groups looking at providing certifications um, for stadiums and other large events. So uh, clearly people are seeing value in, um, in, in making the public more comfortable with going out to these larger events or these tourist attractions. Next, please, Mike. So what hasn't changed? When we spoke about a month ago, California was going into stage two. We're still in stage two, but this is a very county by county um, change. Uh, in the Bay Area here, we're in many counties, we're just getting close to going into phase two. And, and what does that mean? That means we're gonna start to open low risk um, types of buildings, retailers and offices and outdoor, outdoor dining and that kind of thing. Um, the overall approach hasn't really changed much. We're still talking about you need to have a plan. Why do you need to have a plan? Well, at least here in California, the state of California says you should have a plan. And many counties have made that a requirement. You need to have a plan um, prior to opening your business. And, and there's a lot of resources that are very county by county checklists and things that you can go through to help develop those plans. And then our approach really is still modifying public behavior. People wearing masks, people staying apart, people uh, washing their hands, those types of things. So a little bit's changed, but but really we're trying to achieve the same, the same things. Next, please, Mike. So I'll just kind of do a, a quick overview of what we spoke about last month, which is um, what is a plan? What should be the elements of your plan? Ultimately, a plan um, should have a few main elements. How do we how, you should have your prevention? Your infection prevention protocols, you should have some site specific safe work, safe work practices. You should have a plan should somebody that's sick go into your building. How are you going to do contact tracing? How are you going to do cleaning? Are you going to remove people from the building? And there are a whole bunch of other considerations. If your building has been shut down for a period of time, um, are there, has your pest been maintained? Is there rotten food in the fridges? Um, has your HVAC been maintained? Has your water been stagnant? Next, please, Mike. And when it comes to these safe work practices, this is what I was referring to earlier. There's these five or six main things that um, the people, the public needs to focus on to reduce transmission of this disease. It's physical distancing, staying apart from people to the extent feasible. And that can mean different things depending on which county you're in now. Uh, personal hygiene, this is across the board. Wash your hands off and do it the right way. Try not to touch your face. Um, in many areas, masks are required. In other areas, masks are highly recommended. Um, and what we see is that compliance with, with masking orders or recommendations are all over the place. Here in the Bay Area, um, people are pretty good about it. You see masks all over the place. I can't go into my local convenience store if I'm not wearing my mask or kick me out. Um, but I can drive half an hour away to another county and I see a very, very different um, level of, of compliance with masking orders. Um, cleaning, how do we clean? How do we disinfect? Uh, focusing on high touch surfaces. I don't need to clean the wall if nobody touched it or sneezed on it. Uh, medical screening, there's a lot of issues around that. And then the big one is communication. We're trying to change um, the public. We're trying to change what people do. And so a huge part of that is how we communicate uh, those changes. Uh, I'm next gonna talk a little bit about, so we've got this plan. Here's the outline of our plan. Here's how we do these things safely. Um, and we've had, uh, as a company, the opportunity to work with a lot of different uh, cities, police departments, fire departments, business owners, uh, schools, and we've written a lot of these plans and we've done a lot of training around these plans. And we're at the point now where we're starting to implement them and we can see how well they're being implemented, what some of the challenges are. Um, so I'm gonna give an example here of a restaurant. And this isn't, uh, this isn't a client, this is a personal experience. Uh, last weekend, my wife finally had enough. And she said, we need to get out of the house. I'm, I'm sick of it. So I said, okay, get in the car, kids. We're going to go somewhere where there's a restaurant. And we're going to go eat out for the first time in three or four months. Um, so we get to the place we're going to eat, and, and I immediately put on my industrial hygienist hat, and I start to assess. Um, these, this restaurant clearly has a program. Um, they're clearly making a, a really big effort to comply with all these things. So as I look around, I see the tables are spread really far apart. 
There's hardly anybody in the restaurant. Most people are sitting outdoors. Um, there are barriers set up between the receptionists and the guests. Um, as, as people are walking into the restaurant, the, the receptionist is spraying hand sanitizer on everybody's hand. Uh, there's nothing on the table, no salt and pepper, no ketchup, uh, nothing that can be shared. All the, all the wait staff are wearing masks, they're wearing gloves. I don't know what kind of cleaning they were doing. Presumably it was fine. Um, there was signage. So, you know, I, I looked at all this and I said, you know what, this looks pretty good. I feel comfortable bringing my, my family into this restaurant because I need some fish and chips. Next, please, Mike. As we sat sit down and, and we, we ate early, but as people started to filter in, um, my, my IH spidey senses started to, started to tingle. And I started to observe a whole bunch of issues with the plan. The plan looked really good, but now I'm seeing the implementation of the plan um, and, and I start to notice some challenges. Um, as, I, as I look at the receptionist, I can see, whoops, she forgot to spray that person. And then somebody reaches over and you know, somebody from the public grabs the spray bottle. Hey, can I use that? And so now we're starting to share things. I see as people line up for the bathrooms, um, the, the wait staff are running back and forth between the kitchen and our little takeout area and they're crossing paths with with people waiting in line for the restrooms. Um, as we sit down, we're given a paper menu for our meal, which is great. That's disposable, one less thing to clean. But then I'm giving a, a traditional, you know, plastic menu uh, for our drink menu. That's, you know, who knows when that's been cleaned last. Um, we see that the wait staff is wearing masks and gloves, but the masks are starting to slip down and people are touching their face with gloves. And then I see somebody uh, pick up my water glass and, and, and and pour some water in my water glass, and then go to the next table and do the same thing. So, um, you know, gloves, uh, you know, not not practicing good hand hygiene as they move back and forth between surfaces that they're touching, um, and a bunch of other things. Uh, you know, the wait staff running around, touching different surfaces, um, and then the diners aren't wearing masks. Um, you know, so as the, the wait staff uh, is interacting with the diners, we've got people that are unmasked, and then finally, you know, my the, the guy brings the check to me and I, I okay, just put it on the table. I don't want to touch that, but there's a pen in there and I have no idea if that pen's been cleaned and I have my doubts. So a whole bunch of little issues that that kind of lead to um, the thought that this plan might not be doing all the things we think it's doing. Next slide, Mike. And then on the mechanical side, I look up and, and there's a couple, there's a, a group that sits down across from me down on the bottom left there. And they're clearly not in the same household. They're, you know, hey, good to see you. It's been so long. And I look above their head, and there's a there's an HVAC unit, a split system right above their head. And I look at you know, where that air is blowing across their table to my table. And even though we've got six feet of distance, um, you know, now there's there's air movement pushing their 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 droplets potentially into my table. And I look at the at the I take a peek into the kitchen, and there's a giant hood exhausting air from the entire building. And I see these, these kitchen workers standing in front of the hood and I just can't help but think all of the air sort of makes its way to that kitchen past, past these workers. Uh, next slide, Mike. And so anyway, that was my experience having dinner. So the question is, is did the plan work? They had a pretty good plan in place, did it work? And the question is sorta, of. some things worked pretty well, some things uh, didn't work well. But the, the common elements of, of, of all these issues was people. Uh, the intentions were good, the plan was good, but when executed, it's hard to get people to do these things consistently. Um, and there was a lot, of, um, a lot of people crossing paths, a lot of incident, incidental contact, <clears throat> but I think we need to keep in mind that definition of close contact that CDC puts out. We're not as concerned about incidental contact, people walking by in a hallway. It's really close contact face to face, my droplets going into, uh, into your face. I think also communication goes a long way. The owner of this restaurant um, did, a, did a good job of communicating to the staff. This is what we're doing to protect you. Uh, these are the things you can expect to see that are gonna be different as part of your dining experience. And I think that kind of communication really goes a long way to making people comfortable with going into your restaurant or your business or, or whatever you've got. Next slide, Mike. And so um, we've been saying this a lot for a long time. This is a public health issue. The solution is with the public. 
Um, we need to think of all these things we're doing, this physical distancing, personal hygiene, protective equipment, cleaning and disinfection, medical screening, communication, all those things are a package of in, in, uh, interventions. Uh, not what practicing one of those things alone is not the solution. We need to be doing all those things. The public needs to be thinking about all those things. Um, real quick on novel approaches, there's all kinds of things in the marketplace right now, coatings that you can put on a surface and you don't have to clean for 60 days, uh, things that you can fog, all kinds of things. Um, I would say a lot of those things don't have um, a lot of good data supporting their effectiveness. So kind of buyer beware. And then one of the big challenges is too, as a, as a building owner or a restaurant owner, you may have the best plan in place. You may have the most trained staff that knows how to do all of these things. But the big X factor is the public. You can't control what the public does when they come into your space. And that can, that can make, uh, that can be a real challenge. So how do we educate the public? Um, it's a difficult thing to do. People don't like to change behavior. So really what we need to be focused on is simple messages. Um, we can't throw a hundred things at somebody and expect them to, to, to understand, to be able to change their behavior. Their behavior. So simple mess messaging that's consistent, that's reinforced, and there needs to be some accountability. Like I said, my, my convenience store doesn't let me in if I wear a mask. So the first couple of times I forgot a mask, I had to go back to my car. Guess what? I don't forget my mask anymore. Um, this is an ongoing thing. People are are already very fatigued with all of the information, all of the um, all these things that they're asking to do, and and we do see it degrading. And I think it's going to continue to degrade, uh, probably pr pretty rapidly. The ability of the public to to do all these things consistently, and, and that's really, I think, why there's so much concern about a second wave, about a third wave. It's really really hard to do these things consistently across the population. Uh, but I, I think that's really what's going to um, help reduce the chances of that second and third wave coming. And with that, uh, Marie, I'll, I'll pass it to you. Okay, well, thank you, David. I know we have some uh, some overlapping issues. Um, I'll tell you, I, my husband and I went to a, a restaurant opening yesterday. It was an outdoor restaurant. Um, and, and what I noticed is that restaurants and, and other employers are really trying to do their best um, but, but the, it's about employee education as well. I mean, you, you hit the nail on the head that you, know, you, can, you can buy masks and gloves, but one set of gloves is not gonna get you through a full shift. You've gotta be able to change gloves. You have to reapply hand sanitizer. Um, and a lot of that boils down to training your staff um, and also having the appropriate resources. I know a lot of my clients right now are, are panicked about the cost of providing masks and providing you know, sufficient numbers of gloves. Um, we're, we're working through some creative solutions to have, uh, you know, Silicon Valley, uh, I think, support some of that, that cost and not have to pass it on to the consumer. Um, but, but that's going to be a real challenge. So, um, so let me shift gears here. I'm going to talk about employment litigation risks first. Um, I, I actually talked to a well-known mediator this morning and I asked him what kind of cases are coming to you right now? Um, because we have seen, as Mike pointed out, an uptick in litigation. Um, but what are these claims going to look like? So, so these are the three areas where in the employment landscape, we expect uh, the most new litigation. So uh, age discrimination claims always go up when the economy goes down. Um, there are lots of layoffs happening right now. They are still happening. So I know that we're talking about going back to work, but there are a lot of uh, sectors of the economy, you know, restaurants are the, are the best example that um, they're reopening, but they're not reopening at full capacity, which means um, they're either doing additional layoffs or they're only calling back a few people. Um, and, and so what happens is your, uh, your process for, um, you know, how you're going to bring people back or how you're selecting people for layoff uh, has to be, uh, you know, supported by a legitimate non-discriminatory business reason. So are you picking people based on age or disability or some other class or are you looking to metrics like, you know, performance reviews? You know, we're bringing back the people who got fives on their last performance review. We're not bringing back the people who got twos. Um, and so you have to do a really good job of documenting your decisions um, about why you're selecting people for layoff or why you're bringing people back. Um, because I do expect it, and we're already seeing an uptick in age discrimination claims. Um, then there are disability claims. So. What it's um, disability under the Fair Employment and Housing Act or the ADA. Um, we're seeing a lot of, of disability-related claims. 
um, for folks who need accommodations and uh, employers just are not getting creative about what kind of accommodations they can offer. So there's a real risk here of disability claims. Um, I talked to somebody the other day who said, well, you know, we didn't bring this person back because she was on leave, um, you know, for the six months leading up to this and other people have been, you know, working the whole time. And I said, well, look, she's ready to come back from leave. You can't count a protected leave of absence against her when you're looking at, uh, you know, length of employment as, as one of your criteria for bringing people back. Um, so, so the, these are all, you know, important factors uh, that you have to consider uh, both in age and disability claims. Um, and then finally, wage and hour claims. We expect uh, a number of uh, wage and hour claims based on reporting time pay. So what reporting time pay is if, if somebody is scheduled for an eight hour shift um, and they show up and you don't have enough work for them and you say, you know, sorry, you're scheduled to work, but we're going to have to send you home. You need to pay them half of that scheduled time that they were scheduled to work. So for an eight hour shift, it would be four hours of pay just for, for the trouble they took to report to work. Um, I think the struggle here is, you know, staffing levels. We're seeing this uh, in restaurants, even in factory settings. Um, we're seeing problems with just lack of, uh, lack of work. Um, you need to schedule accordingly. You want to avoid having to pay uh, reporting time pay. Um, so schedule accordingly. If that means laying people off and giving full schedules to a few people, as opposed to short schedules to others, that's, it's a better business plan. Um, Mike, why don't we move to the next slide on, on HR considerations? So, so I want to go over a number of HR related considerations, um, essentially to help you avoid liability uh, and avoid lawsuits. Um, there are a number of things you need to keep in mind. So the first thing we talked about this uh, during our first webinar, um, the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. So the FFCRA, um, that was an act, uh, it's a federal act um, that provides for paid sick leave specifically related to COVID-19 related issues. So. Um, for example, I am sick or somebody in my household is sick or I'm experiencing symptoms and I need to go get tested and I'm waiting on test results. Um, so there's a number of, of criteria here um, that provide for 80 hours of paid sick leave. Um, there was initially a lot of panic from employers thinking we can't afford to provide 80 hours of paid sick leave. Um, the good news is that uh, this pay is reimbursable under tax credit. So it's, it's almost an immediate reimbursement um, through the payroll, uh, payroll taxes. So it's the duty of the employer to understand, um, you know, if you have 500 employees or less, uh, this act applies to you, put the posters up, educate your employees. You want them to know about this. You want them to use it. If they're sick, you do not want your employees to come to work. Um, if they've been exposed to somebody who's tested positive and they need to go tested, you do not want them to come to work. Uh, but employees who are worried about where their next paycheck comes from will come to work unless they understand that they can get paid um, for this time off. And so, uh, so I strongly encourage you, it's not very long. If you go to the Department of Labor website, uh, read the bullet points on the FFCRA so you understand uh, who this applies to and when it applies. Um, the California Consumer Privacy Act, I know this is a California specific issue. Um, this is another issue I want to highlight. You know, we're talking about collecting health information from our employees. Um, you need to give notice to employees uh, under the CCPA uh, that you will be collecting health information and how you plan to store that information because you do have to uh, make sure that this information is stored confidentially and, and in a safe manner. Um, we received one question as this has been going on. Uh, I'm just going to read it here. It says uh, the SF Health Department, um, sorry, SF Health Department has reached out to us with information regarding an employee who tested positive. They're looking for a list of employees and contact numbers for those who are in close contact. How do we respond? Um, yeah, I thought this is a good question for the group to hear a response to because I have a feeling a lot of us are going to get um, these kind of inquiries. And I, I bring this up under the CCPA section because. Um, there are a couple factors here. You know, one, if you're going to give any sort of contact or private information uh, to an outside entity, you need to let your employees know that their information has been requested and that you have an obligation to share it. Um, here, there is a legitimate reason for the health department to be requesting this information. Um, you should provide it, but you do want to limit it to names and phone numbers. Um, where there's a problem is when government entities get a little too uh, aggressive and overbroad and are suddenly asking for you know, social security numbers or, or other things that could trigger immigration concerns. Um, so that's where you'd want to be cautious. But, but just names and phone numbers are, 
um, are appropriate and I think necessary right now to provide, um, you should provide it, but let the employee, the affected employees know that you're providing this information. Um, in terms of policies, uh, employee handbooks should be updated to reflect the FFCRA. At a minimum, if you don't want to draft a new policy, just take the poster from the Department of Labor website uh, and add it as an addendum to your handbook and distribute it to employees so that they're you know, aware of the fact that you are an employer that falls under 500 people um, and that this applies to you. They need to know about these, uh, these new laws. Um, so that, that's a quick and easy way to update an employee handbook. You can also just drop in a policy under your uh, paid sick leave or PTO section. Um, there are also posting requirements. So you need to make sure that uh, the FFCRA poster, and there, there is a provided poster, uh, is posted in your workplace in a, in a break room. If you have people working remotely right now, um, the quote unquote posting requirement is sending it out via email or putting it on a you know, company intranet or if you have an ADP or other you know, third party uh, supported platform, post it there. But, but it does need to be accessible to employees in a way that they can find it even if they're working remotely. Um, and then training, uh, you know, this is something that I think David touched on that, that training is going to be really key. You know, we have all of these new policies, all of this new information. Um, you can't expect that your employees are just going to read everything that you send to them. It'd be great if they did, but they don't. You send these, you know, lovely long memos telling people here are the rules. Um, but if you really want them to follow them, you need to do some training. And I'm, you know, whether it's on Zoom uh, or in person, uh, the, the training needs to happen as opposed to just saying, please read this. Um, and then, you know, actually enforcing that training. So th this is a situation, um, and I'll, you know, I'm thinking restaurant context again, where, you know, the, the customer is not always right. Um, if somebody shows up without a mask, your employees need to be trained to turn those people away. If that is uh, a policy or a law in your county um, and, and you're not supposed to serve a guest without a mask, um, I don't know if anybody saw the, the hearings that happened in Orange County uh, earlier this week where people were protesting wearing masks. Um, you could have some very angry customers show up and refuse to wear a mask. You need to turn them away. And you have an obligation to your employees, you have an obligation to your other guests. And so, uh, so we're gonna have to change that mentality that the customer's always right. There, there is of course a polite way to handle it. Um, I think about this in our own law firm too. We're gonna have signs everywhere when we reopen saying that you must wear a mask. And, you know, if we have a client or a plaintiff's counsel or a witness show up without a mask, um, you know, we are training our staff to say that person must be turned away. So, so this is something that's going to affect all, fact, all uh, sectors of our economy. Um, Mike, let's switch to the, my last slide. A um, couple more spots I wanted to hit. So for telecommuting, you know, I do think that is uh, going to be how we're going to be running most businesses uh, going forward. But we will eventually be getting back into the workspace that a lot of people will continue working from home. Um, I know that, that a lot of companies had to move very quickly to figure out how to support workers from home. Um, but, you know, if you didn't already have a telecommuting policy and you still have people working from home, now is the time to draft one. You need to have rules around telecommuting. What is the expectation in terms of response time? Um, do you have expectations about, uh, you know, the hours that, that people are working? And, and that goes to my next slide, inflexible work schedules. Um, whether it's in home or in the workplace, um, what are you expecting? Are you expecting somebody to work nine to five? The, the answer right now is probably no. Um, so have a clear policy and, and, and the policy might be you need to communicate with us and tell us what those hours are. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a set time frame, um, but you do need to know when you're able to reach your employees and when you're not able to reach them so that, um, you know, if they tell you they're going to work from 6 a.m. to 3 p.m. and you email them at 6.30, you need a response and, and what kind of response are you expecting? Um, and then finally, uh, commuting. So I think it's time to reimagine commuter benefits. Um, in San Francisco and several other uh, large cities in California, I know other places on the West Coast, employers are required to provide commuter benefits. And so, um, you know, we've seen large companies like you know, Google and Apple have buses that people board and, and ride to their workplaces. That's one way to satisfy the criteria. Um, you can provide, uh, you know, Muni or BART cards or whatever your public transportation is. Um, but right now, people don't really feel comfortable taking public transportation. So, you know, reimagining, uh, are you going to give, you know, credits for scooters? Are you going to give credit for lift bikes? Are you going to reimburse parking uh, or, or move away from, you know, traditional public transportation 
um, commuter checks. So th there are lots of options here. I would encourage you, um, you know, to, ke to keep your employees happy, but also to keep them safe, to, to reimagine what you provide as commuter benefits. So I, I know that that was a 30,000 foot view. I can see that some questions are coming in and I know we're short on time. I'm happy to answer any follow-up questions on these employment issues and, and uh, we'll respond to emails. Thank you, Marie. Uh, you know, we have just a couple minutes, so let's maybe try to check off a few of those questions. Sure. Um, let me just go. It, uh, Marie, you talked about accommodations in ADA. I mean, give us a feel for how far an employer has to go. And, and let me preface it and throw in the hypothetical here. If I've got an employee and they have a, a, a pre-existing condition, let's say they're given their age, they're in their 70s, they've got respiratory issues, and they really shouldn't be taking BART, for example, but yet their job requires them to come into the office. I mean, what accommodations and how far do I have to go as an employer? Sure. So, um, you know, I used to have, have clients tell me, um, you know, that same scenario, that this job has to be done in the office. And I would say, why? Uh, and I would get responses like, well, they manage a team of people. The team needs to see them. You know, they, they need to make sure that, you know, Sally is actually at her desk at nine. Um, we don't live in that world right now. And so, um, so I would challenge employers, you know, you have to go pretty far. If you can support somebody telecommuting, um, you have an obligation to do it now, uh, more so than you did before and for a longer period of time. Um, on the flip side, if you have a business, let's say it's a factory and, and you really do have to show up um, to work on a factory line, you truly cannot do your job from home. Uh, the appropriate accommodation is uh, a leave of absence. So, um, you know, leave of absence, even if it's for a lengthy period of time, um, is I think a good solution. You might have to fill their job in the meantime. Um, you know, with a temporary worker, perhaps, but I think there are a lot of creative solutions. But, but the answer is we're going to go have to go a lot further than we have before uh, to provide a reasonable accommodation. Right. Thank you. Let, let me switch gears and, and go to David. David, mask. I mean, you, you talked about being out and seeing some in some locations, other locations, people are wearing them. Let's take the scenario where people are wearing them. I see people wearing all different masks. I mean, some seem to be more the traditional mask, some seem to be more protective, some seem to be just simply handkerchiefs. What really constitutes a protective and healthy, I should say, safe mask? Well, according to the CDC, it's just any face covering, a bandana, um, a, a scarf. All we're trying to do uh, with, with the face coverings or the masks is it's source control. Right. These, these things aren't intended to protect the wearer. They're protected to keep the wearer's respiratory droplets close to them uh, and, and keep them from going out and exposing others. So the idea being if we all wear some kind of mask, we all get some kind of reduction of respiratory droplets floating around in the air. Okay, great. We, you know, we, we have a few questions that, uh, given the time. I just don't think we're going to get a chance to get to them. What we'll do, as I mentioned at the beginning, is we've got email addresses. We'll respond. The appropriate uh, professional will respond to you. Uh, we'll do our best to answer those so everybody will get an opportunity to hear from us. Uh, I want to thank you, David. I want to thank Marie. I, I know you guys are very busy and you're leaving this presentation to go do COVID-related work. Uh, so thank you for taking an hour out of your very busy schedules to join me and to give a very important and helpful presentation. To those attending, thank you very much. We really appreciate it. Um, you know, hang in there. We're doing this fight together, both on a professional level as well as a personal level. And again, reach out to any of us. We're here and happy to help you as you guide through this extremely difficult and kind of maze of issues as it pertains to COVID. Thanks again. Take care. Thank you. Thanks a lot.